And we are rolling on March 8, 2016 at UCLA, where it's another gorgeous sunny day, as it usually is. The sunshine is shining, and we're about to hear from Brianna doing an impromptu speech on, I fear, the future. Fear it in just a second. Okay, let's fear the future. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brianna. Hi, Brianna. Hi. You know what I'm sick and tired of? I am sick and tired of reading articles where all the journalists say that millennials are entitled. We're, we're entitled, we're selfish, we have nothing to look forward to in the future because we are basically wasting our time. We're selfish, and we don't know how to create a future for the generations to come because we don't know how to make a life for ourselves, they say. And you know what? They're right. They're right because the future is a scary place. And when we hear the quote, I fear the future, by Pam Kramer, who is a golf, um, an American golf uh, sports person who, or what? Yeah, she was a winner of a major golf tournament in America. And I fear the future is very relevant, and it is scary. And I'm going to explain this through three examples. The first example will be the singularity, where we have an increase of artificial intelligence, and scientists and experts are saying and proving that it is the demise of this artificial intelligence that will make us ruin our civilization. My second point will be the notion of climate change and how we're not addressing it in a timely manner, at which we're going to end up in a situation where we will have to go to Mars because our planet will be completely destructed as a result of the way we're treating it. And my third point will be the notion of human empathy and how the rise of technology and social media has made it so that we don't have enough human interactions anymore. We don't know how to connect with people anymore. And that's dangerous. But in my first point, with this notion of the singularity, the singularity explains that artificial intelligence is going to destruct us. And we should care about this. We should care about the singularity. We should care about fearing for the future because the future is ours, right? If we're living today, if we're going to look forward to tomorrow, then we need to know what we're going to be scared of. And the singularity is a scary thing to imagine. And what this explains is that we will create a type of intelligence that will be able to outsmart us. And what it will do, it will reprogram itself, this artificial intelligence, so that it will only be able to live when it knows that it has no competition any longer. Stephen Hawking explains that this is the reason humans will become extinct, because of the singularity and artificial intelligence. What the robots will do when the time comes, which is said to happen in the next 15 years if we don't have regulatory practices to ensure that artificial intelligence doesn't kill us, is that they will only live when we don't compete with humans anymore, which means the robots are going to kill us. I fear the future because I don't want to die by the hands of a robot. That's not cool. And my second point, where we should be aware of climate change. I fear the future because climate change is happening. We saw it in Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio's Oscar speech where he made a point and he said the scientists are right. Anyone that is calling climate change a hoax is absolutely wrong. Koalas can go extinct within the next 20 years as a result of the increasing temperatures of um, carbon dioxide in the air. Additionally, this might be the year, or by 2020, this might be the year that the Arctic region won't have ice in its region over its summer. That's huge. The fact that we're making it so that we are killing animals and changing our environment, that means we're affecting our ecosystem. That means we're creating a hierarchy at which we think we're at the top, when in real reality, we're making our own devastation in the long term. I fear the future because we're going to create a system where the world cannot maintain us anymore. I read a study that said if everyone in the U or everyone in the world lived the way that people in the US do, we would have to have five planets to sustain the way we're living based on the pollution that we give to the environment. 
I fear the future because I want to be able to breathe air. I don't want to have to live in an actual bubble without dying or breathing in some sort of crazy chemical that hurts my lungs. And in my third point, with the notion of human empathy, I am so <coughs> sick and tired of seeing people on their phones when they're sitting with their friends. It doesn't make sense. It, going to a party, you think that you would have interactions, right? You think that you would learn from people. It's surprising when people make eye contact with me when I communicate with them. People think that I'm hitting on them because I just make eye contact with them and I smile at them. I'm not hitting on you. I'm trying to have a good conversation. And I fear the future because people are no longer aware of what it means to be human because we don't have the capacity to make relationships anymore. We rely on the use of social media and the validation from the like button to tell us that this is the way that I am a good person by the notion of having the most popular posts on social media. I fear the future because when we see the uprising politicians such as Donald Trump who refuses to allow refugees into our country and then we have the same people in the US who refuse to let them in saying that they will move to Canada as a result of Trump becoming president, how can our American privilege be so naive and so arrogant that we are so much better than the rest of the world? I fear the future because humans no longer have the ability to empathize with one another. So in my three points where I fear the future, or where I explained why I fear the future, I explained to you why the singularity at which our technology is advancing at such a high rate that we don't have regulatory practices to ensure that these robots won't come and kill us. And then in my second point, I showed you why climate change is happening and how this will be the utmost destruction to our world and how killing the ecosystems and creating an environment where we have to have a constant uh, competition just to live and how that is fearful as well. And then in my third point, why human empathy matters and how we need to be able to learn how to put our cell phones down and how to have a normal relationship with people because we don't know how to empathize any longer. So maybe the people writing these articles who are saying that the millennials are entitled and selfish, they are right. And maybe we should use this time as a way to ensure that rather than fearing for the future and just talking about how scary it can be, maybe we can make, sh make some actions to show that our future shouldn't be a scary place any longer. Thank you. Thank you. 710. Okay, we'll start here. Hello everybody, my name is Elsie. Hi Elsie. Hi Elsie. I'm really glad I get to be the person to go first on certain things I like because I really like this speech. I liked how you were clear and your volume was good throughout and how you took to me an unexpected turn with the quote and going very concretely into reasons why we should fear the future and I think that that was very, the unexpectedness of the way that you looked at this quote from looking at it from like an existential point of view, you went to a very practical, here's what's happening in our world right now, and I found the whole argument very engaging. Thank you. Thank you, Elsie. Improvement? Um, hi, my name is Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> um, Omar, I think, was very good. Um, um, well, I thought what was just different was how you walked to the triangular way. That's really creative. Um, I saw you kind of moving your camera, though. But yeah, she was killing me. <laughs> <laughs> but that was very good. It was very subtle, and, and I was able to, it got my attention. But I think um, throughout your speech, I don't know, I got a sense of, like, kind of, like, anger. I don't know, you're very, like, aggressive the way that you're speaking. So, But definitely I do understand because you're trying to convey fear um, within your audience, um, definitely like being killed by robots <coughs> and not having like, you know, sincere relationship with people. So I think in that sense, um, overall the speech I think was very good. Um, yes, I think it was good overall. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah. Well, uh, really, I enjoyed your speech, Ben, and I enjoyed the fact that you didn't use notes. <laughs> Yeah, so you uh, have a memory, yay. Um, careful of doing this with your hands. You still are doing it now, and this. 
with your hands, okay? Uh, steepling, it's a romper room no-no. It denotes some sort of superiority to your audience. You don't want to give off that even subtle nonverbal cue. Um, you started with the millennials, which, you know, encompass your audience. So they're going, yeah, me, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, sort of said, we're selfish, no, we're not selfish, just we're selfish. So they, you got their attention, and I thought that was excellent. Singularity, climate change, and human empathy were your three points, which you nicely previewed. Would have liked a SIG statement, a little bit more uh, developed of why it's important we think about the future, anticipate the future, and be uh, future uh, thinking and you know, sort of uh, project out what's going to happen in two days, two months, and two years, etc. Two decades. Singularity was a good point. Well argued. Um, there is some concern, perhaps a little melodramatic, but perhaps there is concern. I'm reminded of the movie 2001 where Hal, 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 I don't know if you saw the movie, but when he took over and took over the uh, a spaceship and wouldn't allow humans to do anything. And uh, Right, that was sort of foreshadowing of this idea that the machines will uh, become our masters and take us over. Uh, so that was a pretty interesting point, and unexpected, and pretty sticky. Uh, your second point, the polar bears and the Arctic melting, not as convincing to me, but... Uh, mm, you know, I'm sure for the true believers on the campus, uh, they liked it. So, um, uh, I personally don't find that uh, compelling evidence to fear the future. I think there's going to be some adaptation. And mostly what I fear is how we're, how we're going to choose to adapt to the changes that are coming from climate change. I fear that there's going to be an overreaction. But... That's another side issue. On the, um, I think uh, maybe um, if you wanted to do something, maybe the, the islands in Florida and other places flooding and stuff like that would have given you more dramatic, uh, immediate consequences. Just if you're going to go that way with global climate changes, it's now, you know, popularly referred to. Okay, on human empathy, really excellent. People are hitting on you when you just smile or make eye contact. Yes, it's gotten pathetic. You look around restaurants, look at parties. Uh, you would think that this is, you know, melded to the hand, right? Um, Donald Trump, uh, you know, a gratuitous, uh, I guess it was good for most of the people out here that probably hate his guts. Didn't really exactly follow from your point about empathy and moved to Canada. You started to kind of get ranty there to me. I didn't follow your logic exactly there. Um, your summary was excellent. Your conclusion was good. Your tie back to the millennials was good. You used all your time short of 14 seconds. Really excellent job. Thank you. Okay. And you are. Does everyone sign the roll sheet? Over here. Layla. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, I'd like you to do uh, speaker number one, the first quote. <coughs> so would you go to the board, erase, I fear the future, and put up the following quote. I don't believe necessarily the past is in the past It's eternal. It's all around us. By Peter Ackroyd. could not come in front of that. Oh, mm, mm. Brown square, that would be swell. <coughs> Layla stands before us, managing attention, communicating respect non-verbally, saying to herself, I respect my audience. Finding friendly eyes near the front and the center, say your name, feel the love, and speak to us about your quote. Hi everyone, my name is Lala. Hi Lala. I want to start by asking everyone a question. If you had the option of traveling back to the future, where would you want to go? Okay, you don't have to answer me now. But um, just this question, I want to ask you guys to keep it in the back of your mind. Um, I don't know where, there's many possibilities you can go. You can go to the 60s where people were much more mellow, or you could go to 1776 where the Declaration of Independence was first signed, or you could go to perhaps the first Oscars that Leonardo DiCaprio was nominated and demand that he win an Oscar. <laughs> the options are plentiful. And um, Today, I want to talk about this quote by Peter Ackroyd, an English biographer. He once said, I don't believe necessarily the past is in the past. It's eternal and it's all around us. And I agree with this quote because in some way, I feel like he's trying to say that you don't need a fancy time machine to go back to the future because the future is here. And in order to support my position, I will give you three examples. Uh, the first one is the fashion trends from the 80s, second is World War II, and three, and three, uh, and three is technology, in particular the technological advancements of the television. And why I think this quote is significant to us, because in a way it kind of is about us. We are artifacts of the past. We were born in the past, we're present here today, and it's only logical that some remnants of the past remain today. And wherever we go in the future, there will always be remnants of the past. <coughs> so my first example is fashion trends from the 80s. Fashion trends change every day, basically. 
and some trends go in and in from style and out of style. And every generation creates their own style, taking trends from past decades and making it their own. Sometimes it's even difficult to keep track of what's in. Well, taking a look back into the 80s, some fashion trends have actually come back till today. Uh, some fashion trends include leggings, oversized sweatshirts, ripped jeans. Those are just a couple examples. Other examples are v-neck t-shirts, uh, sports coats, long jackets, and this is just another example of how the past has effects on the present, including the way we decide to dress today. My second example is World War II. This war helped determine which countries were developing the fastest and which were the most powerful. This war, uh, this war was this war helped the United States' economy in a greater way than World War I did. It also helped decisively bring to an end the Depression, and this cre helped create industrial complexes all around the country. And I believe how um, this, also, this helped to determine the longer term effects of the war that had on the United States, which is the United States being a world power and also a leading power in the economy. And this example just shows how the war, the World War II, helped the, tech, have helped the advances of the United States in several ways. And this showed how the past can have effects on the present, including the world power that the United States today is. Also, the World War II helped shift the power from Europe to the United States and then the Soviet Union. And obviously the Soviet Union is no longer around. So this example just continues to show how the past has effects on our present. And my third example is technology, in particular the television. In 1927, a 21-year-old named Philo Taylor Farnsworth helped create and demonstrate the first techno electric television in San Francisco. Later in the 1950s, the television was readily available to most Americans. And I'm sure we've all seen pictures of those big boxes that used to be TVs. They're big and bulky and frankly not up to par to the quality we expect now. Today we have flat screens and handheld devices to watch television and even roam the internet. There's uh, 4K resolution, 3D quality, so we have sensational uh, picture quality, and even have curved screens to watch our television. I feel like this example just goes to show how the past, including the technological advancements of the television, have merged to what we see television today and the type of quality of life we expect today, especially when watching TV. In summary, I have given you three examples of how the past has remnants in the present. The first was fashion trends from the 80s. Second was World War II and where America stands today as a leading power. And three was the television, how it has advanced throughout the years. I believe that these three examples just go to show how the past has remnants that stay, are available in the present for us. It just continues to show how <coughs> the past is not necessarily in the past. It's eternal and it's all around us. And I agree with Peter Ackroyd's quote, and I think that what he's trying to tell us is wherever we go in the future, there will always be remnants of the past here today, and that we should be serious about this. And to end, in conclusion, um, since everybody's had a few minutes to decide whether or not to travel back in the, into the future, have you guys decided where you would want to go? What era to see? What history to watch? The options are plentiful, as I said before, and I think it's important to understand how the, wherever we go in the future, the past will always be a part of us. Thank you. Thank you. 553. I have one. My name's Arian. Hi, Arian. I like your 
your speech. It was very structured. Um, it was very, it had really good flow. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the topics of my impromptu actually is kind of opposite to this one. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to be arguing how the patch is in the past. So it was kind of mm -hmm. cool to see uh, this side of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it, it's hard to uh, keep the past from the past sometimes. Uh, yeah, but, you know, these are said and done. Thank you, Ari. Hi, my name is Greg. Hey, Greg. Um, Hi, Greg. Like Ari, I also like your speech. Um, I thought it was great. Uh, just wanting to work on would be uh, slowing down and not being monotone. That's about it. Mm -hmm. Everything else is great. Let me ask you. Lala, what were you hoping to accomplish today? Trying to support my position on the quilt. Okay, good. You did that. And uh, speaking wise, no notes, and oh, you did yeah. that. Yeah. I was proud of that, but I feel like that's why I got choked up a few times. Yeah, well, um, you stumbled a little, but at least you didn't go to your pocket for a note or something. So I appreciate you relying on the memory that God gave you, and so that's excellent. Past is not the past, it's in the eternal, it's all around us, and I think you made a pretty good case for us. You said <coughs> fashion, you look at uh, people, what people are wearing today, and there are remnants from the 80s, and you gave the example of the ripped jeans and so forth and the leggings and so forth and so uh, we see do see remnants of the past in the area of fashion on World War II I had a little bit more trouble uh, seeing your argument on this one but um, I guess you were saying that the United States and the, the, the leaders were got their power from how they having won the war, and that's the remnant of the past, right? And then you made the point that the USSR is not uh, in existence any longer. So that was pretty good. Um, the well, the television. Let's talk about the television. Um, uh, your third example, the television, that was a good example. And you, we can look at that. We can still sort of imagine the big old box that you, it used to be and imagine that it's just shrunk and come, come down in size. Um, I guess, you know, you had about 2 minutes and 15 seconds left, so I could have... Uh, seeing you flush this out a little bit more, slow down, offer more details, uh, and uh, offer a more emphatic style of delivery, be more enthusiastic about your topic. Uh, but, um, yeah, uh, w did you find out any more about this British writer, or other than just that he was a British writer, or was there anything more that would have added to his saying this? Did he write a novel about... A, a, a historical novel about this, or was there any nothing, not nothing sure. pertinent? Not much. Okay. All right. Well, you got the job done, and you did a good job, and you did it without notes. Thank you. Okay. Is there another volunteer? I'll do. <laughs> Okay, let's move. Let's move, move, move. Where's the roll sheet? I just handed it to you before. Oh, you did? I, and I lost it. There you go. Oh, okay. I And I am. Then speaker six, and it goes on to the next page. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. Um, uh, 
How do you spell your last name, Michael? B E C O I A N. A N. Yes. Bezoian. Close enough. Close enough for government work, huh? <laughs> Even better than government work. Close enough for government work. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I'd like to hear you speak on the first topic, which is by George Bernard Shaw, and he said, Science never solves a problem without creating ten more. Science never creates a problem, never solves a problem, without creating ten more. And that's by George Bernard Shaw, your favorite writer. My favorite writer? Yeah. That's not my favorite writer. <laughs> I try. <laughs> I like a lot of this stuff. Pygmalion, I like. Androcles and the Lion. Uh, good, good stuff. I like him. Uh, Mother Courage. Okay. Stands before you, managing attention, communicating respect non verbally. Finding friendly eyes near the front and center. Say your name. Feel the love. Start your speech. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Bazillion. Hi, Hi, Michael. You know, last week, I was on nationalreview.com. Found an article I found really, really interesting. So I opened it up, and I saw something else that was interesting. Just some concept. So naturally, I Googled it. Then I found a couple more interesting things just off that Google search. And from that, it branched to more and more interesting stuff that I wanted to read about. So, I mean, naturally, I, I just read them all. And then it was like 15 tabs open. So, science is just like this. When Mr. George Bernard Shaw says, science never solves a problem without creating 10 more, it's because humans are driven by curiosity. I'm going to give you three examples to explain why he is absolutely 100% right. First, the discovery of penicillin. Second, the discovery of exoplanets, or planets outside our solar system. And third, the discovery of gravitational waves. In 1928, Alexander Fleming accidentally discovered penicillin. Bless you. Um, and it was just a complete accident. And here we go, he saved millions of lives. Unbelievable. So, naturally, from that point onwards, people began experimenting and finding out new things about antibiotics, saving people's lives, and from one discovery, hundreds more were raised. What else is an antibiotic? Can we discover more? Can we, uh, you know, find the cure to whatever disease? But, of course, with those new questions came new responsibilities. People have abused antibiotics. People either don't know how to use them or they just, you know, they're not, they don't use it regularly and people have gotten, um, or rather bacteria has become, uh, it, antibiotics just don't work anymore. So, a new question is raised. Antibiotics don't work anymore, or at least they're becoming less effective. What do we do? More questions are raised about what's the next step forward. How can we come up with the next antibiotic that is strong enough that can defeat this super resistant strand of bacteria. So again, the first point I made was that the discovery of penicillin led to a bunch of more questions. Just one accidental discovery and hundreds if not thousands of questions. The second point I'd like to make is about the discovery of exoplanets. Up until 1992, not a single planet outside of our own solar system had been discovered. Then something magical happened in 1992, and an exoplanet was discovered. 
it was pretty much almost by accident. It was just, just, you know, really, really far away, light years away. But we discovered it. Since that point, about 2,000 other exoplanets, a little more than 2,000 planets outside our solar system have been discovered. And, of course, naturally, with these discoveries, more and more questions have been raised. Are these planets habitable? Can we learn more about the atmosphere of these planets? Are these planets habitable? What's, our, what's the future of, you know, planetary research? What technology can we make to further advance our study of planets outside of our solar system? So, as I've shown with this point, the discovery of planets outside our solar system, or exoplanets, have provided just a, they've opened up a can of worms, basically. We, we, we had one question, just one exoplanet, discovered that, and now we have a whole entire field of research just trying to find other planets, especially ones that look just like our own. Three. Um, the third and final point I'd like to make is that, um, is about gravitational waves. Now, exactly a hundred years ago, in April 1916, Albert Einstein came up with this theory of general relativity. Part of this theory included something about gravitational waves. Now, since then, scientists have been trying to prove that gravitational waves exist. You know, scientists thought he was right, they just didn't have proof of it. They did all kinds of things to discover these gravitational waves. Basically curvatures in space-time, but it's too sciencey. Um, but anyways, they, they, since then, for a hundred years, they had been trying to discover gravitational waves. February 11, 2016, not too long ago, scientists discovered gravitational waves. They found it in existence, they have proof of it. Of course now, that, that's, that's been discovered, questions have been raised about wh what else do gravitational waves do? Now that we know they exist, what can we know about them? What else, what else can we learn about gravitational waves. So, again, as I've shown with gravitational waves, the more scientists learn, the more they want to learn, because the more questions come up. So, as evidenced, I believe that George Bernard Shaw is absolutely right when he says, science never, create, uh, never solves a problem without creating ten more. I've given you the example of penicillin, I've given you the example of exoplanets, and I've given you the example of uh, gravitational waves. Humans are incentive-driven creatures. And naturally, the more scientists learn, the more questions they ask, the more problems that arise, it's not a bad thing. We learn more. We should absolutely encourage what this quote says. When there's no problem, uh, when science never creates a problem without answering, or rather, never solves a problem without creating ten more, it, it's, it's, it drives society forward, so we should absolutely encourage it. Mr. George Bernacho is absolutely right. Thank you. Six seventeen. Where are we? Hi guys, my name is Vlog. Hey Vlog. Hi Vlog. I really like uh, your examples. I like the exoplanets. Uh, I like how at the end of like each uh, section you're tying back to your original argument. I like how you relate it to us. Um, the topic itself is very interesting, um, but overall it was really good, very well structured, and I like the examples that you're using, how you're like, constantly questioning us, and, like, or like your speech is constant questions, what can we do this, what can we more, you know? So. How can we know more? Yeah. Improve them. Hi, my name is Anthony. Hi, Hi Anthony. Uh, I like your speech a lot, that was really good. Um, just a few minor things, uh, one was when you were um, pacing, or going back, um, you kind of, I mean, you kind of went back to the other side of the room rather than going in the middle, and I thought you were going to study that for a moment, but it's very small. And then uh, your first point that you made, I liked a lot, the bacteria thing, but I wasn't sure um, how it uh, connected to a science problem, just because um, you, right. you, you made it seem that the way you described it, it was almost that uh, it was a problem of doctors and human error over prescribing medications rather than science, scientific research not getting there. So that's pretty much it. So overall, it's great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. You make, they make good points, Michael. Like your speech, thought you um, 
were pretty knowledgeable about it. I would have liked you to have introduced George Bernard Shaw to the one or two or seven people in the room that don't know who he is. Okay. Um, yeah, you uh, started off with your national review search, which went to 15 windows being opened, and I kind of was looking for that national review 15 windows. You did go back to the, the you know, curiosity-driven creature, but not to the windows open in the National Review search, so I would have liked a better uh, tie back. Um, so you gave us penicillin, the new planets, and the gravitational wave as your three examples of so-called creating more without creating more. science never solves a problem without creating ten more. Hmm. Yeah, so that's quite a few more, um, and that that suggests you know that you give numerous ones. So um, I agree a little bit with on all three that um, they. I guess there's a new scientific problem to try to come up with a new super penicillin to solve the superbug, I guess, would that, would that be your answer to him? Is that your kind of, is that the right. new problem of the, the, the new, is that, is that kind of what you're saying? Said, yeah, because it's become resistant. I think yeah. I might have mentioned it. Okay. We yeah. want to find something that Yeah. So we, we have new problem to, right. to look at and solve. Um, I question the, um, I saw the, I saw how that was a problem. I didn't see how planets were, new planets were a problem, and I didn't really see how gravitational waves were problems in any sense of the word that I understand problems, except problems in the sense of a scientific problem of right. not understanding something. So I think you would have been wise to to have defined that a little bit more carefully. Um, you skipped your SIG statement, so uh, don't do that. Sell it to your audience. Remember to put that in. Right, I tried to get that at the end with the whole, it might not necessarily be a bad thing, we should encourage it, but I realized you that. You knew you did it, yeah. Okay, good. Um, one of the... Um, uh, dangers or difficulties with this topic and there was nothing you could do about me picking it. I just randomly chose that. I actually liked all three of them actually. Uh, I was thinking that the Buddha thing would have been a little heavy for a Tuesday afternoon. but um, I was hoping you gave a Friedman one because I had an excellent idea. I was going to give everyone a penny and say yeah. that penny's worth seven million dollars every minute we spent $7 million. So I know, I know, but I've, yeah. I've heard that, the Friedman rant so many times, I just didn't want to hear it again. <laughs> um, yeah. Shame. Shame, yeah, I know. Okay, uh, so overall, you did a good job, and thank you very much. Okay, is there another volunteer? While we're uh, doing that, uh, you, you, you said it last time. Where's the Where's the roll sheet? Do I have it? Right over where? It's in the middle package. Oh, I see. Okay, good. Okay. Um, I want to check on the people that went to SLO. Arian, you went to SLO, right? Yes, sir. Three days? Two days. Good man. And Fog? No? Yes? You went to SLO? No. Greg, you went three days? I wish. Two days? One day. I was there Saturday. Well, actually, I was there Friday night and Saturday all day. So you
<laughs> Anthony? No. no. Anybody else go to SLO? Just Greg and Arian. Greg, okay. Is there any word on the dates for the LMU? It's going to be, I tried to look it up, I couldn't find it. Yes, yeah, there's word. This Saturday. Yeah. Uh, with, it's uh, both of you. No, just one day. Okay. <coughs> Eight to six. At LMU. Loyola Marymount University. <coughs> Okay, who are you, sir? My name is Caesar. Your name oh. is Caesar. Caesar, and I am round three, speaker two. Round two. Round three, speaker two. He. There you are. Okay, go to the board, sir. Oh, could you pull that table over to the board? That's. Makes restricts our walking ability. Yeah. No, put it behind Elsie. Yeah, that's better. Okay, I'd like to hear you speak on topic number three. The only way to predict the future is to have power to shape the future. By Eric Longshoreman Hoffer. And I'm sorry to say that we need to change a battery. So, Eric Longshoreman Hoffer. How do you spell that? Long, L O N G. Shore, S-H-O-R-E, M-A-N, 